I'm your host Aranjya Bansal and welcome to these collaboration episodes with Redline Racing. For this week I'm joined by Josh Kegel. He started his career as racing bikes and later moved to motor cars. This episode will feature his 20 year racing career and his expectations for this season. Feel free to like this video and subscribe to my channel. And lastly, enjoy the episode. Hi Josh, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm very well, thank you mate. How are you? Very well. Uh so comparing to the last year, let me just uh start off by congratulating you as signing as the driver for the Porsche Carrera Cup and for Redline Racing as well. So, how do you feel about this opportunity? Yeah, really excited. Um we were meant to be doing it last year and things got halted a little bit with uh with COVID. So, yeah, really uh really excited to to finally get going and testing's been going well. Um we had the media day the other day and that was a good day out. So, we're at Croft tomorrow actually. Mm. So, yeah, just uh really nice to be back in a car. Simon and the lads are uh, are all great lads and uh yes, yeah, nice to be back at home and doing what we do. Yeah, that's true. With with media interactions, I know media interactions still going out through Zooms, or you can you can meet up or face to face in 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 UK. How is that like? Uh, so the media days, believe it or not, behind closed doors. But it's um, Porsche have their own media guys. I think invited media people. Um, so it's kind of closed closed to the public, so to speak. But they kind of do what they have to do uh, mm. from from a distance but yeah it's kind of surreal everyone's you know everyone's got masks on everyone's nowhere near each other um but it's become the new normal so i guess we all just get on with it that's true and since you've been racing and you've been in this uh, you have had this career since like 20 years now or, or more than that uh so how are you adjusting with this cup and with the car that you have for this year how's that mindset like with it um I mean ultimately speaking you know every every car fundamentally is the same you're just trying to tweak the things that you do to get the best out of it but um I have a, a really good engineer called Guy and uh, between him and uh, you know my teammates uh, everyone sort of helps each other we're just fortunate um you know we have Dan uh, Camish obviously we couldn't really have a much better reference for data so it's like going back to school i guess um we after every session we sit and we analyze and see where we can improve and what i can do better mm. um but you know it, they're not the easiest cars to drive but i have a really good bunch of guys around me that make it as easy as possible so it's why do you say that it's, it's not a easy car to drive i mean what's the hard aspect associated with it eh uh, i guess it's just raw you know it's got no abs no traction um it wants to understeer uh, it wants to oversee you know it, it wants to do everything uh that it wants to do but it, once you kind of uh get your head around you know what you need to do to get the best of it um you know it's it's a rewarding car to drive mm. it's just a case of unlocking the potential of the car with what i do so it's it's good it's, it's exciting it's you know it's a, a great place to be sat yeah I I remember this conversation that I had like 2 or 3 days back with Jake as well uh, who's your teammate this year and uh, yeah. even he had the same thing to say that this car is actually a beast <laughs> it's <Yeah>. pure power <laughs> yeah so I've um, I've come from from GT3 cars yeah. and also the TT cup car everything had traction it all had ABS so you kind of learn into drive those cars to their maximum Mm. and then you have to kind of wind back a little bit of it when you get in the Carrera Cup car. Mm. Fundamentally it's the same, uh but it's just with the ABS car, you know, it's all about the downforce is you know, with you. Yeah, you know, smash the pedal as hard as you can, keep it for as long as you can and let the car do a lot of the refinement. Whereas in the Carrera Cup car, it's a lot more down to you. Mm. Um uh, which is a good thing, you know, it's basically down to you on the day really you know it's if you do a good job you'll have a good result and if you don't you won't <laughs> right and while speaking about that um your you initially started with your racing journey by racing bikes 
and then you switched yeah. to motor cars. So talk to me about that. What sparked your interest in, in bikes initially? Uh, initially, my dad, I got my first bike when I was two. Um, my sister, uh, my older sister was uh, big into horse riding. Um, and then dad got me a, a motorbike. Uh, just used to take it and I think he was trying to appease me really. Just used to let me ride that for half an hour in between whatever my sister was doing. Um, and then when I got to six years old, which is the youngest you can start to race bikes in the UK, mm-hmm. uh, he just asked if I fancied having a go at racing. So I went to watch a few. And so then I started motocross, um, progressed to road bikes when I was 15, I think. Um, I had a lot of injuries motocrossing, actually. I had a lot of injuries on road bikes, to be fair. But um, started road racing when I was 15 or 16 and then progressed through to British Supersport and few other things um sort of till being about 23 years old and then uh so yeah just kind of about everything one thing leads to another you know it sort of spirals hmm. and uh your the the biking career you were racing there for 11 years right you were a you were yep. a racer as a, 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 a racing racing the bikes and when you switched to motor cars uh was that like I mean, there would be some challenges, but what were the some of the same transition that you may have seen in motor cars as well, except going fast, of course? Uh, I think the the biggest thing, you have bad habits from bikes going into a car. You know, like on a bike, you want to turn in earlier everywhere. and Because of no not, downforce or anything, right? It's, it's the yeah, exactly. Dynamic. You know, you just have to, on, on a bike, you turn in a lot earlier. Obviously, the the brake pressure is quite a lot different um it other than the concept of going around the circuit and the idea of racing i mean you have a good found you know you have a good basis of knowledge mm. to draw from mm. but it's kind of, it is like starting again mm. it's a do you know the the things you feel on a bike are so much different to things you feel in a car mm. all the things you're trying to feel in a car it was 2013, right, when you first switched to cars and you were racing for the Volkswagen Racing, right? Yes. It's, so we we did the Volkswagen Racing Cup because we're a Volkswagen dealer, um, oh. and uh, we one of the bosses from Volkswagen UK used to race the Volkswagen Cup. So we knew about that just because obviously we'd seen bits of PR and things, and. Uh, I don't know if I would, we just thought it looked like good fun. So it, it was an obvious place to start, really. What what car did you drive for the for the Volkswagen Racing? What was that car? Uh, it was um, started in a Mark V Golf and then went to a uh, Scirocco. But we only did we only really did that for one year, and then I went to Germany to do the Scirocco R Cup in Europe. Mm-hmm. And um, in the same. Uh, around around that time, you also did a 24-hour race, right? That was in yeah. Dubai. Dubai. Yeah, talk to me about that. I mean, those races so, have really inspired me and just made me respect the drivers even more. Like you're sitting in the car 24 hours. Talk to me about that. Yeah, the the 24-hour race, you know, is uh, they're just a surreal environment. It's kind of... But I think everyone's got so much respect for everybody of how, whether it be from the guy driving to the mm. guy doing the tyres to the, you know, the the lady or gentleman that's making the tea and the coffee and the hospitality, you know, it's it's a long slog. Um, and it's usually, although you only see the race for 24 hours, it's a long build up before it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I just love the whole sort of, I don't know, it kind of almost feels like you're at some kind of a festival or a carnival or something. It's crazy, like the the whole event's just like sort of massive. Um, but yet you feel such a small part of it, you know, when you... It, it's just a really cool thing to do. Um, and I think, I mean, I'd, love, I'd do any opportunities I ever got, I would do, to, uh, you know, do some more 24-hour races anytime. When- so when you're doing that 24-hour race, before that, do you need to go on a particular diet, a form of exercises? How, how, how's that? like? Because you're in the car and you can't get out of it to pee. So how would that work? <laughs> well, you're in the car for maybe two hours a time. Um, oh. But you, so there's four of us driving. Hmm. Um, so you can, uh, you're only in for maybe two hours at a time. Um, so it's not as bad as you would think. Um, 
the it's still quite a long time when you think a normal sprint race might be 25 30 minutes mm. but you're usually sweating so much that you kind of you don't really need a pee so much um, and worst case scenario you you have to go where you are so but <laughs> you tend to fall out with your teammates if you do that too often so you try and hang on to it if you can <laughs> right uh, with with the 20 and there's so many cars that you've that you've worked in and then again in 2015 you moved to Audi Sport TT Cup that you were talking about earlier so yeah. why did you make that switch and what was again some of the differences that you saw with the car and with the form of championship that was organized with Audi so the that was a natural progression from the we did the Scirocco Cup in 2014 Mm -hmm. um, which was actually the final year of the Scirocco Cup and then Audi took over with the Audi TT Cup um, which it was a selection process so they, they selected um, one or two drivers from, from each country within Europe well all, to be fair all over the world you know there was guys from everywhere um, the, if you had done the Scirocco Cup you got um, offered an entry into the TT Cup Mm -hmm. So that kind of, we it was always a two or three year plan anyway in Europe. So um, we, that was a natural progression into the Audi TT. Um, but it was a, you know, it was a really good championship. Um, taught us a lot. We had uh, mentors. Uh, we had um, data guys. We had everything we could ever wish for um, all at our disposal. And essentially every time we got in the car, we had a briefing before, a briefing after. They drive it's like school for racing drivers almost, you know, they, they kind of, they are trying to show you the, the right way of, of mm. how to go around it and where, what's a good environment to progress. Um, and for me, that, that helped me a lot. Um, obviously the cars are all the same and it just offered itself a, a great opportunity to compete on a level playing field, but on European tracks against some of the best guys in Europe, you know, it was just a, a good all-round championship to be in. Right. And while talking about the cup, I did find, I think there was this one interesting video that I that I found, and this was, this is related to... <laughs> yeah, the... I, I, I want to talk about this. What exactly happened when, when this, when this incident occurred? In which car were you in? You were in the red... So the I was in the, the yellow car. Um, uh. So... The Norris Ring is a street circuit in Germany. Um, so the what happens it because the hairpin there is such heavy braking zone. There's, um, there's you can see the cars when you there's quite a lot of bumps on the way in. Hmm. Now initially I got quite a lot of stick for this um, as if I'd just missed. You know it looked like I'd braked too late. Um, but on the data I I actually braked. I think I braked five meters earlier than the lap before. Mm -hmm. But the um, the bumps had just triggered the ABS. So when I was in, obviously, because there's only two main hairpins there, the brakes were, everybody was really struggling with brake fade because the brakes were so hot. Oh. Um, I'd braked earlier anyway, but the bumps, it just, I was just fully in the ABS. So although it was just approaching the corner, I actually had no brakes really. Okay. Um, but obviously, Gosher had turned in and I had no, I was trying to avoid hitting anybody, but Gosher had, I'd obviously, I couldn't get to the outside and she'd start turning in. So, um, yeah, it was just uh, one of those things. But, but that's, that's what racing is about. And with this, yeah. uh, when, when there's like races going on with Formula One and there's a crash that happens, so your front wing is sort of like taken in the pits and it's changed. So what happens when you, are, when you go in a crash, especially when you're driving a car like an Audi or, or a Porsche? If you get in a crash, what does happen? You, you retire instantly? Uh, <laughs> Essentially, yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you don't really get many second chances in terms of crashing. To be honest, it's usually uh, a done deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you also then moved on to the Audi R8 LMS, right? So that was, yes. of course, a faster car. And yeah, and with that, with with, with that change, did. You said driving and the cars are sort of the same thing. But with that, did you face face any more challenges because the car is now 
more faster the ch- the the form of championship is more different what was that what was that like when you drove for drove the audi r8 uh, it was a culture shock uh, obviously the tt's front wheel drive hmm. 300 brake horsepower i think the the r8 is obviously rear wheel drive i don't know the exact horsepower but i think it's five 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 and a half hundred horsepower so it, obviously you've got loads of aero and um, the um yeah it I mean, it was a big change. Uh, I had to try and adapt as quickly as I could. Um, the I went to the first official blank pan test, and I'd I'd never even driven a rear wheel drive car, so there was a lot to learn. But the I don't know. We're kind of of the philosophy that um, the best way to learn is just by going straight in at the deep end. Uh, I probably was in over my head a little bit, but I also again had a lot of really good guys around me. I had great teammates, great team. Um, I probably fast tracked the learning process there a little bit. Um, it's a shame I was in such a good environment when I didn't have enough experience. Um, but you know it, that also taught me a, a lot. And then it just, you know I, I got an opportunity to do a guest round in the TT Cup again uh, at the end of that season. Um, I went back and I was uh, quickest in the first free practice. I think I qualified third, and then I was. Sort of top five in every race. So, it, whilst it was a big change, and at the time you felt like you were struggling quite a lot, when you then go back to, you know, when I went back and had another go in the TT, you realise how much at that point that you've actually learned. So it it was just a case of uh, adjusting really with the with the changes. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, trying to be realistic about expectations. Uh, being realistic about why I was there, you know, I was there to learn a lot. I did learn a lot. Um, whenever they're thinking we we're going to try and win the championship, uh, and to be fair, um, yeah, I'd do the same again, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And uh, now, finally, coming down to the final few questions, just to run down really quickly for our listeners as well, what are the types of different cars that you have driven, and what would be that one dream car that you want to drive with a in it for your future career in, or in the coming years? Uh, dream car to drive. So I've driven quite a few front wheel drive. Uh, I drove a British touring car. I've driven a Carrera Cup car. Um, the GT3 car is a mega. Um, but if I was, if I could drive any car, I think I would have to be, uh, I'd love to drive the 911 RSI, you know, the, the mm-hmm. GT2, car, you know, the, um, endurance car, the the Le Mans car, so to speak. I think that would look uh, that looks awesome. Mm-hmm. Right. And while talking about this in the twenty year career, what has been that one memory that you may have had from a race that has that has really struck with you and has sort of like kept you motivated in, in achieving more? What would be that one memory? I know it's a hard question to think about, but yeah. Um... <laughs> There's been, a, I guess, the big standout one for me was um, the Audi TT Cup. Um, the qualifying. I did the, yeah, so I did the, well, not even the qualifying, it was the, um, I'd done the Scirocco Cup for the first time ever, you know, I'd never driven left left on drive. Um, I'd never driven the European circuit. So there was a lot, a lot of things to learn that year. And to be fair, I did struggle quite a lot. And then, just kept chipping away, kept trying to work at it. And then the year after, um, I just kind of clicked with the, the TT. And I had a, I got my first podium at the DTM weekend in mm. uh, Oshersleben. Um, You know, it was a dry race. There was no there was no anomaly as to why I got a podium. I got a podium because I was quick all weekend. I drove well. I did what I did. And I don't, that was, you know, when you kind of felt like, from the year before, you know, when I was maybe finishing around 16th, 17th and just seeming to have loads of problems all year, that whole situation felt just unachievable, you know. So I guess it just restores the faith that if you, you know, I was working out, doing everything I could do and, uh, you know, on the right day, you could do it sort of thing. So I guess that is probably the standout moment. Right. And what about one of the most... Uh low points or should I say the points that were really low that has been in your racing career or even one of the most um, I, I spoke about uh, Jake as well one of the most hardest crash or that incident that has maybe like made you reconsider 
of the career or said that okay, I need to like slow things down a little bit? Um, not so much cars, you know. I think I unfortunately came from bikes where you know crashing's part of it and getting hurt's a part of it. Um, the uh, from a from a bike point of view, I had a big crash in twenty twelve. Um, I was too far. I was lucky I didn't break my neck, so that kind of just I don't know. Kind of made us re reevaluate what, a little bit as to what happened in the crash. What what went wrong with that? Uh, so it was Donington Park, and the I was slipstreaming somebody coming onto the back straight, and um, he missed a gear. So I, I my front brake lever clipped his seat unit. Uh, so I went from I was flat out, and then straight hundred percent front brake pressure. So I went straight over the handlebars. Um, down the back straight, but got collected by the bike. So, look, I mean, I, I broke my collarbone and shoulder blade, a few ribs, but to be fair, all that was, you know, quite fine. It was just, the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I was lucky not to break my neck. And I think it just sort of reminds you how, you know, it, in an instant, my life could have changed forever, you know. Mm. And uh, I don't know, I still wanted to be involved in motorsport, hence the reason we're in cars now, you know. Um, I did. I'm not. Uh, I didn't want to sort of retire off and do nothing. Um, Car-wise, biggest low point. I'd probably say 2018. We did um, blank pan sprint in the Bentley. Um, we had a lot of technical issues with the car. It was the it was the old shape Bentley. Um, we had a lot of problems with the car. There was a few crashes that were not necessarily. My fault. Well, I, you know, when I wasn't in the car, kind of thing. There was a few crashes uh, in the race. I never even got in the car. It was just one of those years, you know, where you just think, I don't, you know, you kind of lose sight happening. of. Yeah, you know, and then uh, I did the last three. Got an opportunity to do the last three rounds of. Well, the car got the Bentley got written off actually at. Um, the car got written off at Mizano. Uh, I wasn't in it, to be fair. Um, but uh, because it was the old model, no, that's a lie. Sorry, it wasn't at um, written off. Mizano. Do you mean it, that it, it was it was taken over by another company? Is it? No. So the the car actually. Do you know? Do you remember Spa Twenty Four Hours, uh, where there was a massive crash where the Bentley got hit stationary in the track, and the car basically split in two. W which year are you yeah. talking about? Which which year was it? Two thousand and eighteen. I um, I didn't. I, so I was only doing the sprint program. The endurance program was using the same car, okay. but the the car got written off. Um, so then the team had a decision to make. Basically, the, there was no car to finish the season, which had, the season had already been terrible anyway. To be honest, we'd had loads of mechanical issues, and there was just it was just not ideal. Um, so we decided to we got an opportunity to do the last three rounds of touring cars in the MG again. That was a an old car. It, mm -hmm spent more time in the garage than it did on the track. It, it was just one of those years, you know, where I think everything that we sat in, it just was difficult to remain enthusiastic, really. Mm. Um, but that's why we... I, I wanted to go back... I wanted to do the Carrera Cup after that because I've had so many good years in Audi TT Cup, you know, in the one make championships where it, you are in a level playing field. The car is a good... you know. I wanted to go back to basics essentially and mm. uh, you know just start enjoying it again which right. hopefully and, will do yeah uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I wish you all the best for that and uh, this is the last question of this podcast and since we talk about the high moments we talk about the low moments that has happened in your career so I want to ask you that whenever these moments happen how do you like pick yourself up how do you keep yourself motivated it's it's a bit of a philosophical question and and it could be seen as a motivational answer as well. How do you how do you do that? How do you keep building onto that spirit when you're overtaken and things like that keep happening? How do you keep doing it? Because it's such a hard spot to succeed at that when you when it when something clicks and when something happens and when it's right and you know when you have those moments where it's you know you feel like you're on top of the world, it's like a drug mm. and. Once you've felt, once you've experienced that, you're just constantly trying to chase that. I think with everything that you do in the rest of your life. Um, so for me, I mean, my drive 
comes from, I guess a lot of it comes from when I was racing bikes, you know, the, you're always measured by how fit you were, how much you trained, you know, and uh, I don't know, I kind of always strive to think if I set myself up off the track as well as I ever can, that no one can ever question my commitment, dedication, you know, mm -hmm. it's just down to on the day if you do well or not. Um, and I guess, you know, you just, in the back of your mind, you know, the good times, you try and remember the good times and, it, you know, they're the things that you're thinking about when you're, you know, when you're in the gym and you're struggling or when you're having a bad day, you know, you, you try and think about the times that you were on top of the world. And uh, I don't know, I guess, it, you know, then the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and then, you know, it's all, you kind of build from there really, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess you, you also have to learn to draw a line under things. If you have a bad weekend or if you have a bad session, um, at the end of the day, it's done, it's finished, you move on. Uh, Try not to carry it forwards. That's that's well. Uh, that's very well said, uh, said Josh. And uh, I think with that said, we've come down to the end of this podcast. And um, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. And I wish you all the best for all the races. And uh, I'll, uh, of course, I'll be rooting for the team ahead. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate. It. Thanks for having me on. And nice to meet you. And uh, I wish you all the best too. Thank you so much, Josh. If you like this episode, please subscribe to my channel. You can also hear it on other audio platforms. The links are in the bio. And I hope to see you again for this Bonspot Show.